we will begin. Um, this is the uh, Efficient R Book Club. We are looking at chapter six, or at least an equivalent to chapter six, Efficient Data Carpentry. Um, I skimmed their version of the chapter, but you know he had come into the chat saying, uh, this chapter is kind of out of date. You might not want to bother. But they did have like the framework I, I felt, still found useful, even if the specifics weren't necessarily useful. So, um, so what with that, what we're going to talk about today are um, like the fact that it's useful to clean data at the beginning of a project to save time in the long run, and a little bit about what that means. Um, and then we're going to do a tour of the tidyverse. I'm going to talk a little bit about all the packages that come along for the ride when you. Uh, install Tidyverse. I'm going to talk a little bit about Janitor, how we can use that to kind of somewhat automate some common data cleaning tasks. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about data table. I do not use data tables, so um, if other people have thoughts on it, it, I do have some thoughts on that fact that I don't use it and why that might be changing. Um, and then we're, we'll do a very, very brief introduction to targets and the, the target uh, universe for pipeline efficiency. Um, again, I don't use targets nearly enough. I think that is about to change uh, quite a lot, but um, so I, I am not qualified to do a really deep dive on that, but I can at least get us started. Oops. All right, so why data carpentry? They had this quote that I really liked. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. That the point being, you know, prepare going in and you'll probably save time in the long run. Um, like one of the things that made Hadley Wickham, you know, I said, at first I said famous, but then I was like, well, okay, he's famous to nerds, um, stats nerds specifically, but he uh, had this paper just formalizing the concept of tidy data, which once you see it, it's really straightforward. And of course he like made the tools to make it easy. Um, and he also had ggplot for that. But um, anyway, so the, the general idea of tidy data is that each variable is a column, uh, each observation is a row, and each type of observational unit is a table. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, so like that's so, that's really simple. And that's kind of like, that's database design, but the, going into the details of what it means and what is an observation and um, what is an observational unit. That was the paper that kind of, um, or I don't know, he may have already been on the map, but it's, I think the first thing I heard about from him. Um, and it's where the book R for Data Science kind of grew out of is that paper. Um, so it, it's a little bit complicated because what makes a separate observation can depend on, you know, it's what are you looking at? That's what makes it a separate observation. So sometimes things, that's why the pivot wider and pivot longer exist. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, other than that, it's not that complicated of a concept. Uh, and the reason you wanna do that is that if you have this consistent structure, then all the tools that come after the tidying can just kind of assume, okay, you've got this structure. Now let's do things with that structure. Now, like the, the like tidy models doesn't really assume, but it, it um, helps you, it's helpful if you do have that tidy data already. And so, uh, yeah, that's the, the general idea of why we're doing this. They also talk in the book about how data carpentry, um, that's kind of like the fancy name, there's munging, there's uh, data cleaning, there's all kinds of names for it. There are some very like, you know, sometimes people really hate uh, the idea of data cleaning and complain that, you know, like 80% or more of data science is data cleaning but it is super important. Um, it's something that I definitely, like at my previous job, did a lot of work to try to push back up the line, like, hey, can you guys store this a uh, little bit cleaner? Um, sometimes it makes sense not to, you know, to store it a little dirty and then clean it up, but the stuff coming to me would sometimes be messier than it had to be. And so uh, cleaning is very important. All right, so now we're gonna start going through uh, the tidyverse. So I'm starting with the ones that 
probably most of us know, but maybe not. Um, these are the ones that have hex stickers on the tidyverse.org main website. Uh, Tibble is kind of the core. That is the, uh, it, and sorry, all of these, the, like the quotes after it are what the um, title of the package is in the description, um, which sometimes is not all that useful, but we'll go from there. So Tibble is just the package that has, um, that has the constructors for Tibbles. It's wrapped in pretty much the rest of the tidyverse. Uh, a Tibble is just a data frame and a data frame is just a list technically, but they have some special rules for Tibbles. Um, they don't have row names. Uh, you can have list, you can have columns that have Tibbles inside of the columns. Um, so some fanciness there, but that's, that package is just dealing with the actual making of the tibbles. Uh, dplyr is, um, as, as it says there, a grammar of data manipulation. That is the one for like uh, mutating columns or changing the data that's in columns or creating new columns, um, cleaning the column contents. Uh, and then there's tidyr. And those two, you know, like the division between them is not super clear. A tidyr is tidy, messy data. Um, that one I think of at least more as like when you have to pivot, when you have to change the structure of the data, tidyr is what you're looking for versus dplyr is when you want to, you know, take a date field and uh, normalize it to UTC to reference the talk I just gave a little bit ago for Our Lady's Room. Um, or if you want to figure out the day of the week from a date field or, you know, different things where you're just taking the data and doing something with it. Uh, per is functional programming tools. Um, depend, like it's very useful if you have uh, repeated tasks of um, for each row of the, you know, for each value of this column, I wanna do something kind of complicated. It's becoming less and less necessary because of the like across verbs that are in dplyr now, but I still find myself using per quite a lot because I find it easier to comprehend sometimes. Um, there's reader makes it into that core of the tidyverse that's for reading rectangular text data, uh, mostly for CSVs, but also like tab separated or any other um, like structured. Uh, and when it says text data, the data doesn't have to be about text, you know, it doesn't have to be character, but it's stored as uh, plain text. Uh, there's four cats, which is four categoricals or factors. Um, tools for working categorical variables. That one is, um, it's, you know, a little bit silly. It's four categoricals. It's got cats on it, but it's also a, it's factors uh, scrambled. Um, stringer, so simple, consistent wrappers for common string operations. Stringer is technically just a wrapper of the stringy package, which itself is a wrapper of a um, C or C++ library for dealing with strings. But Stringer is all about making it easier to deal with text, actual text, not just things that are stored as text. Um, ggplot2, it makes it into the core of the tidyverse, but we're not going to talk about that a lot here because that's not really for uh, wrangling of data. Although often it's useful to use ggplot2 to kind of see if your data is wrangled yet. So it's useful to have that handy. And then tidyverse is the package that lets you easily install and load the tidyverse. So that's the uh, core idea. Uh, I have a small question, uh, John. Uh, it's yeah. a bit off topic, but um, yeah. I noticed that you use the curly braces notation <laughs> yes. to, to denote the packages, and I have seen it lately uh, in, in many occasions. And <laughs> I'm wondering where it comes from or if there are some uh, standards. Uh, so it, it became a thing on... Uh, social media like Twitter, but then someone pointed out that in every help doc, that's how the wow. package is uh, shown. I was like, oh, oh yes. okay, so that is kind of a standard thing already in R, and then it got picked up as a uh, just a way to say it. I'm inconsistent myself about whether I do it, but it is nice to kind of call out uh, the packages. I do know in like in a package down site which is a whole separate thing, but um, I'm pretty sure it it turns those into links to the packages when it sees those. So like it's standard enough that it's like, oh, okay, I know what that means. Um, so 
Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, when it got pointed out that it's in every help doc, I was like, what? I thought like someone made that up for Twitter. No, that was someone made it up for our documentation. Okay, great. <laughs> all right. So, um, and then I separated it out. There are also, there are a whole bunch of other packages that install with the Tidyverse. Um, and so this next slide is what I call readers, uh, just very beyond read R, different ways of reading or like, you know, interfacing with other um, storage. Uh, first one, there's dbplyr. If you have used dplyr with a database, you have used dbplyr, whether you know it or not. Um, it is what translates the dplyr pipeline into SQL to run on a database backend. There's dtplyr. Uh, which is the one that I wanted to bring up that uh, I don't, I, I like forget this exists. If you want the speed of data table and the like um, grammar of the tidyverse, DD, DT plier lets you like automatically translate between uh, dplyr and I think tidyr, I think most of the tidyverse and uh, data table. So you write the code that you would normally write. There's a Think a thing at the beginning and the end that you have to do to kind of activate it. And then it actually does the execution via data table. Um, it does, you know, it has a tiny bit of an overhead because it has to do that translation. But it's, uh, if you have some really big data that you're trying to do some of the things that data tables good at, um, theoretically, that can be really useful. Like I said, I always forget it exists. Um, I think I'm going to start trying to use it more on some of my big things that are slow. And see what happens. Um, uh, do you need to load it explicitly? It is. It is part of the tidyverse. So it, if you library tidyverse, I'm pretty sure DT player is libraried. Yeah. The um, is if you, for example, DB player, you do not need to load it explicitly. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. I I think you do have to load it explicitly because you have to explicitly say I want to use data table. And there's a step at the beginning where you like you know you take your whatever you call it you know whatever step you want to start working in data table you say okay turn this into a I don't remember what it is like a dtable or something and then from there it's methods that will get grabbed and then at the end you need to collect like you would do with um DB plier. But yeah, in between, it'll just use the methods that say, okay, translate this to data table. Um, when I first started working with the tidyverse, this was a, uh, if it existed at all, it wasn't cooked. And uh, it's probably been a couple of years now that Hadley went back and spent some time and made it work. And it's supposed to be pretty good. I just have never gotten back to try it. Um, and Gus also put tidy table. Um, in the chat, uh, okay. Sorry, I was trying not to throw you off and then you looked at it and I was like, shoot, I just sent him a little, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was just, go ahead. Oh, just the, the DT play R says you have to at least load DT play R and D play R and you can also choose to load data table. And then in theory, at the end of any DT plyr pipeline, you use as data table, as data frame, or as tibble to sort of like collect. Okay. Right? I think it's collect would be the right term, not compute. Yes. But well, yeah, yeah. I mean, collect is the um dplyr verb that yeah. also does it. So so is the you should reserve this only for debugging. Was this collect? That's not doing it okay that's sorry that's the section above is like not mm -hmm. using as tibble okay um cool so yeah it, it exists and i need to try it more i i do actually have something right now where i know what is slow and i keep thinking about going in and fixing it in something unrelated to r4ds but i think first i'm going to try to just throw dt plier at it and see if it makes it fast enough that i don't care anymore um, because that is, that is always the goal. Um, okay. So the repurchase the not, anyway, so that, yeah, there are vignettes and help. 
I believe, in DT Player to kind of walk you through using it. The, I do know the very first time I tried it, the thing I experimented on was faster without it. Um, but I think that was a special case. It was just it happened to be the special case I cared about at that time. And that's why I think I have never gone back and played because I had this image in my head. Um, but yeah, so DT, DT Player is one that, again, you know, like it wasn't even mentioned in the book, but reading this book has reminded me, oh, I should play with that and see if that will help with this thing I'm doing. Uh, so the next ones in here are a little bit more specific to like types of data. Um, there's Google Drive and Google Sheets for um, Google Drive is for interacting with the Google Drive API. So managing like the files that you have on Google, uh, which can include spreadsheets, but Google Sheets 4 is specifically for dealing with the, the spreadsheet portion. There is separately a Google Sheets package that is for the old API and it might officially be deprecated because I can't remember if the old API works anymore. Uh, but if you're working with Google Sheets, you want Google Sheets 4. Um, there's Haven, which, um, you know, knock on wood, I've never had to use. It's for uh, dealing with SPSS, data, and SAS files. Um, very nice that it exists, but it uh, hasn't been a thing for me yet. Uh, JSON Lite, I, at first I was going to like tuck this away as like a, a tends to be backend package, but if you are working with JSON, which is um, what most, like a lot of web data is, um, that's JavaScript object notation, I think is what that stands for. Um, it was built for JavaScript, but it's used outside of JavaScript. It's just a way to store or to, to format data. It's a little, it's fancier than comma separated, and it lets you do um, things like nested lists and things like that. Um, so JSON or JSON Lite lets you uh, read and write JSON. So that's a way to kind of get from the web uh, for, for, from strangely formatted things, whatever, or from things formatted in JSON into Tibble. Um, read Excel for reading Excel files. There's uh, Arvest for harvesting, scraping, harvesting web pages. Um, you have to pronounce it with a non-American accent to, to get the joke fully, I think. But um, that one, it, it is nice. Um, takes It has a little bit of a learning curve, but it's got a vignette and a, the vignette points you to a, um, uh, I don't remember what they call it, but the, the bookmarklet that uh, you can use to, to select things on a web page and generate your RVEST code, basically. Um, I mean, it's, it's actually generating the, the um, DOM selector for the web page, but you can use that in RVEST to uh, figure out how to select the thing you want. And it's really cool when you're doing it, actually, because you know, you'll click on um, a paragraph of text that you want RVEST to grab, paragraphs that are like that, but you'll get other things too. And then you click on those things to turn them off and then uh, maybe you have to click on something else to get the other type of text that's the same. And it does like the computation for you to figure out, okay, which selectors are you actually using to get, you know, to get what you want. Um, so that's, that's useful. That's in, I don't know, it's in one of the vignettes in our best. It'll tell you how to do that. Uh, XML2, again, mostly if like, you probably won't directly interact with this very often, but uh, behind the scenes, for example, Arvest is using XML2 to parse XML or XML-like things. Uh, there's HDTR, or, sorry, HDTR, which is a uh, in the tidyverse, and it's tools for working with URLs and HTTP. So if you're working with an API, uh, HDTR is one way to do that. But since uh, just in the last couple of years, Hadley wrote HDTR2 which is um, he doesn't want to break old things. And so he made it a separate package. HDTR still works. It still exists. There's no plan to get rid of it. But he wanted to change the way, kind of the core uh, metaphor for how it works. And so he made HDR, HDTR2. If you are working with uh, like a web API or other HTTP quest type stuff, and you're just learning to do it, HDTR2, in my opinion, is way easier to learn. So I recommend if you're just starting to go there. Um, I've been working with that quite a lot lately. 
All right, and then there were some leftovers. So there are some that I kind of put in a debugging bucket. There's conflicted. Uh, it's called an, an alternative conflict resolution strategy. It's when you work with conflicted, you can set it to be strict and it like, um, you know, when you, or maybe, you know, when you library the tidyverse library uh, dplyr, it'll tell you uh, that like filter is masking a uh, function from stats, I think. You know, tell you things like that. Conflicted lets you say, no, 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 I always want to use the stats version of filter, or uh, I want to use the dplyr version of filter. And the reason that matters is um, how R works by default is whichever package you library last, well, whichever package you loaded last, which might have been via library or not, wins when there's a conflict like that. Um, conflicted makes it explicit. This is the one that I mean. Uh, so that's, that's that, that is, um, it's, it's described in all the tidyverse, um, or not all, but a lot of the tidyverse websites will tell you, will show setting that up. The tidy models universe also, uh, push or encourages use of conflicted. It just makes sure that the things that you expect to be, um, you know, when you type filter, it means what you think it means is what conflicted is for, uh, and then reprex. Um, is for reproducible examples. Um, it's a very handy package to get at least the basic understanding of because if you're trying to show someone uh, something that's not working, it helps you make sure that what you are copying and pasting contains all of the information to do to show your error. And sometimes, or I'd say probably more often than not, if you go through the trouble of working with a reprex and making sure it works and like trying to cut out as much as you can, you will solve your problem before you ever have to actually share the code because it tells you, hey, this th function you called doesn't exist. And it's like, oh, right, I forgot to library that thing. And okay, now it now it works, okay. So I'm a big fan of Reprex. Um, and then the, the last bucket that I threw in here is there's uh, Lubridate for dealing with dates a little bit more easily. Um, I didn't mention clock here, which uh, scares people. So clock is the newer package than Lubridate, but really it's the lower level package than Lubridate. Um, Lubridate doesn't yet use clock, but my understanding is that's their plan. Clock is, um, so Lubridate works with, it just uses whatever time zone database you happen to have on your computer. Uh, clock installs a specific, it, technically clock wraps the package tzdb, which installs the updated time zone database. And so part of what's going on with clock is uh, it's just making, it's it's even more reproducible. It's making sure that time means the same thing on your computer that it means on someone else's computer. Um, it also, it's wrapping a C++ library that does all kinds of nice uh, time parsing things. And so it standardizes things a little bit more. It is confusing if you use it directly, but like I said, as far as I understand, uh, the plan is to or integrate that into Lubridate, and then you won't have to worry about it. Um, and then finally, uh, Broom is still, or sorry, finally for this screen, that Broom is part of the Tidyverse, but it's also part of Tidy Models. Um, and it's for converting statistical objects into Tidy Tibbles. So it has functions that the idea is you can, uh, Broom ex exports a function Tidy, and you use Tidy to just clean up um, the result of a model or, or the definition of a model or uh, various things. Um, Broom is one of those that every once in a while, uh, something will be like, I'll be struggling to get something into a more usable format. And then I go, oh, wait, let, let me just try to tidy this. Oh yeah, Broom just handles it. So, or, and sometimes it's not Broom, sometimes it's a helper to Broom, but whatever, you can uh, sometimes just clean up some data. And I just, realize that something I'm writing, I might want to just make it a tidy method. And then uh, the idea is when you write a tidy method, it's people can call tidy and it cleans your stuff up into the format that you want it to be. It's interesting. All right. Um, oh, and then uh, there are two more screens left of tidyverse packages. So all of these are things that probably you don't have to call directly depending on what you're doing. Um, CLI is what they're, it's their relatively new package that is used for making the pretty uh, error messages and warning messages. 
and informational messages. Um, they use this across all the tidyverse packages and actually um, the our lib packages as well, or at least they're moving towards doing it. Um, it just makes things nicer. Uh, HMS is uh, underneath Lubridate and can't remember its relationship to clock, whether it might be going away. Um, Pillar is uh, like, it's really what does the nice formatting of tibbles. So it's, I think that one got pulled out of the tibble package. Rag, I, I mean, that's underneath ggplot and um, I don't know anything about rag really. <laughs> uh, and then Arlang is the, uh, under the hood of all the tidyverse packages, it's functions for base types and core R and tidyverse features. Um, very complicated package. Great if you are doing a lot of programming. We have a book club dedicated to reading the docs for Arlang because it is a very complex package, but has lots of really cool and powerful features. Um, it's basically so the book Advanced R. Um, I think the first edition of Advanced R, when he wrote that, that led to Hadley creating Arlang. And then the second edition of Advanced R is basically a book about Arlang. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of the core of all the programming that they do in the tidyverse. And then there's our Studio API, um, which I have barely used. But that's what you can use to um, like change things within our studio programmatically or read different panes and do different things like that. So again, used inside of packages, but not something that you're likely to need most of the time. Um, and then the last uh, pair of packages are ones that are kind of moving towards being superseded. Um, there's McGritter, the, the pipe. Um, it's got, it actually has more in it than just the pipe, but uh, they, the Tidyverse team is encouraging use of the base pipe because it is technically faster and it's, you know, doesn't require a separate package. Um, but there are things with the, the McGritter pipe that are a little bit nicer than the base pipe. Uh, and I'll pause there, Gus, you have a thought? So, yeah, I don't remember exactly where I read it. They're encouraging base pipe but they're not going to use it for a while yeah. because of their policy of supporting old versions of R, which don't have the base pipe. Yes. So, so um, I saw something, and I have not experimented this, with this yet, that supposedly if you install the binary uh, version of a package, you even if you're on an old version of R, if the package uses the base pipe, it gets trans like, cause the base pipe is so low level, it like translates the code. And so when the pa package gets built, the base pipe goes away supposedly. And so you can actually use it even on an older version of R because the base pipe's not there anymore. It's already been interpreted. I don't know if that's actually true, but I heard that was it, the case. That is how it gets. Yeah, Parse. like I know when that, Russ was doing his thing, and then when I've been working on package slides, it's a pain in the butt where you try and right. look at a chunk of code and it looks pretty, and then all of a sudden it's like this really long line and there's no pipes anymore. So, like, right, that, that sounds right as Tan says <laughs> that passes the mental model. <laughs> yeah, my my big question is like exactly when in the build slash load process of a package that all happens but yeah I so maybe oh. yeah so that so that's that was always i avoided using the base pipe because at my old job we had some servers that had old versions of r and i didn't want to get in the habit to of doing something that would break on those um servers but number one i'm free of that particular constraint now and it is technically microseconds faster to use the base pipe. So, um, and depending on what you're doing, it can be quite a bit faster. Um, the difference between the base pipe and the McGritter pipe is the McGritter pipe like is a function. So things have to pass into that function and the function has to execute. The base pipe happens before the code runs. It's in like the interpreter. Is that the right, am I using the right terminology there, Gus? Um, that, oh. So it, ha it ha it's like, 
it's before a function. It's it's like a, a lower level thing. And so R itself never actually sees the base pipe. It sees the code rewritten as if you didn't use the base pipe and you like wrapped the function in the inside of the other function, um, which leads to what? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, it I, it happens somewhere in substitute. Yes. But it, <laughs> and that's built. I believe that's an early step before parsing, but it's that's one of those things where I get frustrated <laughs> and I know enough to like if I hit a problem, I can usually figure it out, but not enough about how it really like deep down works. But I'm I'm poking around for now, and I'll see if I find anything. <laughs> okay, and then uh, the other one that I put here is uh, model R. I, I'm guessing this isn't going anywhere, but they don't teach it anymore. Um, it's not cover covered in the second edition of R4DS. Uh, they said in the notes about what's different that you should just go read Tidy Modeling with R. Uh, Tidy Models is a much better framework than Model R. But Model R still, I don't know, I, I find it useful. I, I haven't like really extensively used it, but I used it in the context of reading R4DS. And it was so, it was nice to have a really simple framework that you could easily wrap your head around while learning other things. Um, but yeah, it's in the tidyverse. It may, like, I don't think they're gonna pull it out of the tidyverse anytime soon, um, but I don't think it's like, I, I didn't check, but I, I doubt it has been updated much, if at all, recently. Um, so yeah, that is, I think that's the tidyverse. I think that's all of them. Does anyone have any other thoughts or comments or questions? Um, yes, about the native pipe or what you call the base pipe. Um, I'm still not yet really convinced that at, that at this moment uh, it, it covers uh, enough um, compared to my grids are because, um, for example, the placeholder is still in clearly experimental stage it is uh, announced since uh, the latest uh, r version 4.3 uh, so you have a placeholder oh, the but... placeholder got expanded in 4.3 4. but 4.2 oh yes yeah right i think yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah i mean i will give you that they are changing it um it works for, uh, the same way so uh in the magruder pipe you can use a dot to mean the thing coming mm -hmm. in yeah. And the base pipe, you can use an underscore, except you can only you have to name the argument that it's going to, and you can only use it once. Versus the Magruder pipe, you can use more than once. So it's not, again, it's not exactly the same, but they're moving towards that. Um, use the base pipe, and you can use the underscore most of the time. And when you can't use the underscore, you can use um, the new anonymous functions or just a normal function and pipe it into a function that does the replacement. Because they say, if you're doing something that complicated, just throwing dots in, it's going to get confusing. And it's not totally wrong. Um, but in 4.3, what they added is you can pipe to like underscore dollar sign, the name of a variable. And uh, that's really nice. I like that quite a bit, actually. I um, I have worked around that many times. And so I haven't actually started using it. But I think I will. Um, well, it, it's worked the same was already present in Magritor. Um, you, you could do that uh, in that package as well. But I have uh, met a case where it currently still doesn't work with the native yeah. pipe. Yes. Okay. With the dollar sign. Yes. So uh, um, where it definitely should work. But yeah. and, and it could be worked around um, by first piping into just the placeholder and then pipe the placeholder into um, <laughs> some code with uh, the placeholder dollar something. That's funny. Huh? So, uh, well, so uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, if you haven't, be sure to uh, like submit that bug. Um, I think they have a GitHub org that you can do our, our bug right. base bugs yeah. on now. So yeah, um, I, I do trust it will at the end be mature and perhaps a full replacement, yeah. but I, I still, I'm still a bit waiting for it yeah. to really um, to say the at the same level. Yeah. Like it drives me crazy that like 
I wish they would finish, you know, because each time they make a change to it, they mean they make changing trickier. Like you have to, oh, you're using 4.2.1. That's different than 4.2.2. That so these things won't work. And it's like, oh, okay, gotta stick with McGritter if uh people have 421. Okay. And you know, if they have four point now 4.3 is probably gonna have some things that in 4.4 or 4.3.1 will be fixed. Um, so yeah, they're absolutely, I think in a lot of cases, the base pipe works and, and like, if you're starting, I think you can learn the things that make sense with the base pipe that maybe you did it a different way with McGritter, but you can learn a different way to do it with the base pipe. That's about as good. So, uh, but the fact that the placeholder isn't always behaving is a little bit troublesome. So that's annoying. Um, cool. Anything else before we move on? So janitor, I, I pulled out a, a couple things. I, um, used to work with like the same database most of the time. And therefore I never used janitor because it was doing things automatic. And I wanted to explicitly say this column name means that column name. Um, but if you're using different data sources, like for example, the reason that I have started using Janitor all the time is I am cleaning things for Tidy Tuesday. And Janitor clean names is just kind of a standard thing to throw in. It, re it takes um, less pretty, less standard names of uh, columns and it'll just standardize them. And it, you can apply some rules of how it standardizes them, but it makes them nice and clean and easy to work with. Um, there's also remove constant and remove empty. By default, those have quiet equals true. And that actually kind of drives me crazy because I want to know what it removed and kind of double check that I um, agree with it. But it is really nice as a quick way to see, oh, this column always has true in it. And therefore, it doesn't really have any useful information. Um, and so you can have it do that. But I do recommend quiet equals false when you're using those. Um, remove empty can be row wise or column wise, but mostly I use it for columns to tell me these columns actually don't have anything in them. Um, also within janitor, there's a table for like summarizing uh, data. And um, like, I didn't list out all the others, but there are, there are things like for dealing with Excel, um, Excel's definition of a date, which is different than most other places. So that's in Janitor. And I wanted to just leave a space if anyone else has something that they particularly like in Janitor. Clean names and the two remove uh, verbs are the two are the ones that I use almost every week for Teddy Tuesday. Right. Moving on. So data table. Um, like I've said a couple of times, I don't really use data table. The The description um, points out that it's for fast ag aggregation of large data, um, fast ordered joins, fast add, modify, delete of columns by a group using no copies at all. Um, so that, that is something with data table, you're like modifying in place in the data frame instead of making a new data frame that's a copy. Um, it does have list columns. Uh, it, it has friendly and fast uh, CSV, read and write um, or TSV or whatever delimited read and write. Um, if you are looking at older things talking about how much this uh, smokes read are, uh, be careful because Vroom, uh, which was introduced a couple years ago and in some situations, Vroom is faster than data table. Um, Personally, like it depends what you're doing, but a lot of times, um, like you only are reading or writing, you know, you're reading at the beginning and writing at the end. And depending what it is, that might not matter. <laughs> like the time it takes to, to decide which one to use uh, is going to be longer than running that thing a thousand times in some cases. So um, just make sure that it matters before you bother trying to optimize that. Uh, and then it says it offers a natural and flexible syntax for faster development. Um, this is one of those things like I used to 
uh, back when I was working on Linux all the time, I was a Vim guy. And uh, actually, I was a VI guy because Vim wasn't a thing yet. But now I would be a Vim guy. And um, Vim is super hard to use. And it's it's confusing. And it's a, you know, it's a text editor that it's just really confusing to use. But once you learn Vim, it's awesome and you you evangelize it you're like oh my god i can you know watch this i rewrote all my code and i what and people can't follow what you're doing it's really nice i feel like data table is the vim of r that uh yeah it's probably better to use once you learn how to use it but it's confusing to me at the times i have tried to learn it uh, i mean i haven't tried that hard which is why i think dt plier is a nice alternative because you don't have to learn it and you can still use it um, so yeah, anyone else have any thoughts about data table? I had my data table phase for, <laughs> for everything in data table and I'd have these giant like data table pipelines and then base, base pipe hit and I couldn't use the dot placeholder anymore. And I was like, I'd rather have base pipe than <laughs> data table. And I really like haven't looked back. There are a few things that I do like, and there was a short period of time where data table did it and dplyr didn't. So like numbering by group was just like grabbing okay. the number itself was, there was a built-in in, in data table, but not in dplyr, but now there mm -hmm. is. <laughs> and then every once in a while, I'll have some date or time column that's a pain in the butt and data table has the i date and i time data types which store dates and times as integers and they seem to be much more forgiving but you do lose john your favorite time zones so <laughs> you, it's just something on starter <laughs> yeah exactly but if i have like my own like just like time column for whatever then right it makes it easier to work with. I think I, I'd never heard of the HMS and I was perusing advanced R, I think it was, and it said Tibble has a time column type and then never talked about it again. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't actually know like how you make it or how it works, but supposedly it does exist. But... Uh... Yeah, I'm not. So there are a few different types of time in Liberdate, which I think it inherits all of those from HMS. Um, and then Clock has its own new types that are a little bit different. And I'll bet you Clock is going to be what you want once it's the the main way of looking at it. But um, I mean, uh, POSIX CT, pretty sure, is an integer. It's just it's just saving seconds since uh, Unix. A lot of them are. It's just like, if you do, like you'll pull something from a database a hundred times and then you pull it a hundred and one times and all of a sudden it breaks. Uh, this, this yeah. Is what it's like it just seemed to work. Okay. Like data table. That is, so I had a whole process where, uh, at, so again, at my old job, I had a bunch of stuff for, doing some standard work with our databases. And for times, I would always, uh, like I had stuff that under the hood converted everything just to integer seconds. And then it would go back to whatever you were trying to deal with it in. But I like I found it easier in my functions that I was writing to think in seconds because then everything else is like, you know, any differences you do, I don't have to worry about okay, in this sport context, it's going to be interpreted this way. And this other context, it'll be this other way. So I can see what you're saying. Um, I can get behind that idea of having a nice clean integer uh, time format. But um, I don't know. I've never, it's very possible that some of the stuff I did would have been easier in data table. I just never got to the point of, I don't know, feeling like I needed to. Um, and there's like the philo philosophical difference is the tidyverse is aimed at um, like saving human thinking time and data table is aimed at saving computer thinking time. Um, 
And most of the time I care more about the human thinking time than I do about the computer thinking time. Um, but if you have something that's running repeatedly, or if you, know, if you have some process that you run and you just sit there waiting for it in order to do your next step, that can screw with your human thinking time because you're not able to actually like move on to the next thing you wanted to try. Um, so that's where data table is supposed to be helpful. All right, let's see what time is it? It's about right, because the last piece of uh, what I barely put together is targets. So there's a big paragraph about what targets is, but the idea of targets is that you can make um, pipelines that kind of that act as pipelines and um, it only runs the things that have changed. It does some automatic parallelization, which I actually um, didn't uh, know about that until reading it about it a little bit. It has some stuff to help you uh, automatically parallelize what can be parallel parallelized. Um, and it just, it figures out what needs to update and then updates only those pieces. So if you change something up high, it'll only change the things that are affected down below that. Um, and there's also the target types package or target archetypes um, that the point of that is to kind of abstract some of what targets does into um, types of jobs and it helps you set them up and make them clean. Um, but sorry, so going back to like the idea is you would have a file or a series of files that are compute this, then compute that, then compute that. And like this thing depends on that other thing that you define that for your, your targets. And then, you know, each of those steps would be a target and it'll run, like you can run it uh, or you can say, um, I need to load this one. And so it'll load all the ones that are, that, that one relies on within the file. Um, that's the general idea of targets. I think we probably will do a book club just around uh, targets and target types and some related packages at some point, because I think there's a lot of useful stuff to learn there. But the the baseline is, you know, you can set up these targets and then uh, targets will help you orchestrate uh, cleaning them up. I, like, I need to play with targets more. I did, I used it a little bit for, um, uh, like a contract job I did and they had it set up and I went, oh yeah, that's kind of nice. But there were some things that were a little bit clunky that I want to learn it better because I'll bet those things were only clunky because of my and the guy I was working with uh, understanding of how targets worked. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's targets. That's as much as I know about targets is that it's this thing that, boy, I really should use more. Uh, but I don't have a lot to say beyond, about it beyond that. Does anyone have any thoughts or stories? All right. Um, well, with that, we're we're just about out of time. Um, we do have, I think we're all set. Assuming, you know, Gus, uh, I, I weaseled Gus into signing up for next week. So that's the last three chapters. They're all covered. Um, I'm going to talk to uh, Kuntai Kim, make sure, because he hasn't been here in a little bit, um, make sure that he's still planning to be here. If not, we might need someone for that last week. Um, I'll have to look at the time, but actually, yeah, I'll just take that one if no one else, uh, <laughs> if he's not able to take it, given the name. Um, I want to definitely spend some time on that chapter. So uh, yeah, that's, that's everything. Does I anyone have one. any? I have one bit of detective work. I I have a bunch of packages, like just locally. I added offensive base pipe notation and tried rebuilding. And I can send the um the trace back in the Slack in a minute, but it looks like it aired out with parse, at least okay. best I can tell. <laughs> and I tried finding the like base r parse and there's some formatting stuff and then a call to it's to dot internal and then calling hmm. parse okay. again so that is now getting beyond my <laughs> I, I don't even know where that lives like i i tried searching but yeah D dot internal means that it's in the uh the code that is r yeah, so. that's I checked and like 
I I searched, I cloned the source <laughs> repo and I tried just searching for files. <laughs> and it, no All success. Right. So that seems, so I think that thing, that conversation I saw was someone um, guessing how it would work and not actually having tried it. So, but it, maybe, I don't know, maybe there is a way to build it uh, and then transfer it over, but it sounds like not not by default. No, it, it sounds like it should work. So long okay. as it's built, it'll get parsed and then somewhere in the parsing operation. But I mean, I okay. can, I'll, I'll dig around and then I'll, I'll send a message. <laughs> to the flag. It'd be nice to know. Um, I have gotten, well, it's quote unquote, gotten used to using the base pipe, which is just, I switched our studio from the Magritte pipe to the base pipe. And then the hotkey just does, you know, now it works. Um, I started doing that kind of just to, I don't know, be more up to date. Um, but it's not perfect yet. So I don't know how permanent that is for me. Um, all right. Well, we will, we will await your further investigation on Slack, Gus, and, um, I will see everyone there and I need to tell the video to stop here.